Sunday school. What's up, guys? Hope you had a great lunch. So I'm, I'm super rusty. So if I'm bad, just fake it. Make me feel better. <laughs> um, a couple of stories real quick. Um, you seen the movie Hoosiers? Raise your hand. Interesting. So Joe, Joe, raise your hand. Turn around, look at Joe. Joe is a body architect at Anatomy, and he was here. Well, we weren't here last year. Luca asked uh, myself to do the Zoom, and I didn't want to do it because I was so nervous to do it on the Zoom. But I said, you know, I always want to do it. It's an absolute honor because this guy asked you to speak. It's like God's voice, right? You want to speak. Spoke. A few weeks ago, Joe said, hey, I'm going to see uh, to Luca's event. I'm going. I'm really excited. And I said, really? You're going to Luca's event? He said, yeah, that's where I saw you speak last year. So that's why he applied at Anatomy. And when I was walking in this morning, I saw these big screens, and I had some anxiety. And I was thinking, it reminded me of the movie Hoosiers, when the coach comes out and he measures like this area. And it's like, it's no, it's no big deal. Because when we do presentations, the screen's like this big. So when I saw that screen, it gave me anxiety. And I turned to Joe, and I said, Joe, you've seen the movie Hoosiers. And he said, I have no idea what you're talking about. <laughs> and I was thinking, man. He makes me feel old every day because he's like twice as strong as me as well. Um, real quick, I just want to thank Luca for inviting me. It's an absolute honor to be here. I don't know um, what else I can say. I see this guy. He's an absolute animal with content um, and fitness, just everything, but most importantly, helping people. And I don't know a lot of people like that. And that's the biggest compliment I can give to anyone. So let's give Luca a round. I start my fitness career. It's 2006. And I get my NSCA um, cert. And I have to get CEUs. We all know what that is. So I'm going to an event in Orlando. I go to this event. And I see this board of all the speakers. And I read this one name. And I said, man, I, I've heard of that guy. I'm, I'm going into this event. So I go into the event. And I'm sitting down. And I'm tired. Like, I'm upset that I have to step away from sessions. I'm upset that I've stepped away from my girlfriend, who's now my wife. And I'm just irritable. I'm bitching. I'm moaning. My life is chaos. And the speaker comes out. And he gets up on stage. And he had this massive energy. And I already feel insecure because I'm whiny, I'm complaining. He gets up there, he says, look, I wrote a book last year. I get a wife. I got three kids. I visited like 30 countries. I own a you know, business, several locations. He says, get used to living in chaos. And at that point, I stopped feeling sorry for myself. I said, OK, good game, Mark. Martin, you win. It was Martin Rooney. That guy's incredible. You ever seen someone coach their ass off like that? I mean, I, I told Joe, I said, you don't want to miss this watch. This is incredible. So you are an inspiration to me. And thank you so much for the talk yesterday. So you're amazing, seriously. All right, so we have this gym in Miami. Culture is everything. But I'm going to have to walk you through the beginning steps. And I used to put this stuff at the end. Now I put it at the beginning. Uh, people I'd like to thank. My wife. My wife, uh, that's Melanie. She's been my best friend, love of my life, and a huge supporter through all this shit that I'm about to tell you about. And I go through it, she goes through it with me. And she is so massively supportive. Quick story about Melanie. Uh, I go out on a date and have a terrible experience. I say, I'm not dating anymore. I, this sucks. It's not for me. I go to a charity event. I see this girl across the room. My friends told me all about this girl. I've never even seen her before. I just heard the stories. She's in a room, random room. And I said, that's what Melanie probably looks like. True story. No idea what she looks like. I walk over to her. I said, is your name Melanie? She said, yes, my name's Melanie. Is your name Mark? Crazy story. <laughs> we talked for two hours that night. 
I had friends in town. The friends were in town. They were going to go to restaurants. They were in Miami. They were doing that restaurant circuit. They were restaurant tours. They were going to check out the cool spots. They were going out to eat Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday. So when I saw her, I said, hey, would you like to go out to eat Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday? She looked at me like she, I, was, I was crazy. She did it. We got married. We've been together 11 years. So she's incredible. Um, my, that's Bailey. He's a rescue pup. They, we found him tied up to a fence in a park in Miami the guy in the middle, and that's Bella, just the most passive pit bull you've ever seen in your life. <laughs> Had to do that, sorry. Okay, who is Mark Megna? So, yeah, I'm a former NFL athlete. Um, we created a concept, our trainers are called Body Architects at Anatomy. I'm just going to tell you a little bit about my story before we get into why the culture is what it is. So I grew up there you go. I grew up in a place called Fall River, Massachusetts. Has anyone ever heard of Fall River, Massachusetts? Really? Have you been there? Okay, I'm sorry. Dorchester. Dorchester. Marky Markville. Nice guy as well. So I grew up in Fall River, Massachusetts um, from an Italian family. Very insecure, shy, overweight kid. I'm sure we have a lot of parallels in our stories. And I was, you know, bullied, super shy. And I didn't know what I wanted to do with my life. But what helped me tremendously was having a strong mom. My mother raised my brother and myself. Um, she was super, super tough lady. She barely got out of high school with her education. But she was loving, she was kind. And the DNA that's in me Everything that's in me came from her, and those are the things that are in anatomy today. Um, my father just bounced when I was six years old. He decided he didn't want that job, and I firmly believe that he was probably a great person, just didn't want to be a father. Uh, I tell myself that. But she saved the day, and she always believed in me. You know, I truly believe in life that our first coach is, is either your mother, father, grandmother, or that person that cared about you when you were a kid. If it wasn't a parent, it was someone, right? Could have been a coach. But it was my mother, Pauline Megna. And, you know, I grew up in Massachusetts. When you think of Massachusetts, you think of Red Sox, Celtics, Patriots, Boston Bruins. And I wanted to play football. I wanted to play for the Patriots. I wanted to play sports. But the reason I wanted to play sports is because I wanted respect. We always say, what's the why? What's the reason you want to do that? I didn't care about football. I didn't care about sports. I cared about being respected. And most importantly, I cared about not being bullied every single day. And I wanted people to stay away from me, to not you know, push me down those hills or just do terrible things that kids do to each other. So I said, I'm going to have to play sports. So I begged my mother to take me to play sports. The problem was that I went to play Pop Warner. And in Pop Warner, there's a restriction. What's the restriction? What? Wait. It's a weight limit. And at like 11 years old, I was over 200 pounds. Over 200 pounds. And when they took me there, my mother said, my son wants to sign up for football. And they said, your son can't play football here. Like every kid here is under 149 pounds. He'd hurt these kids. And although I wasn't good, I was big. So she drove me two cities in the wake of working three jobs across that bridge right there to Swansea, Massachusetts. And she knew a, a gentleman who was a super nice person. In his spare time, he was a coach. And he let me play Swansea youth football. And I would show up there every single day. And the only reason I showed up there every single day that I didn't quit is because she never let me quit anything a day in my life, ever. And I did not want to play after the first day. The first thing they did is said, hey, take a lap around the goalpost and come back. And I was like, the goalpost is like the other side of the field. I can't run down there. So I started to run, and I kept showing up and showing up and showing up. And I started to believe that I was going to be a good football player. And the reason I believed that, my mother took me to the doctor, Dr. Jean Lemaire, when I was about six years old. He told my mother, your son is big bone. He's got big bones. He's going to be a big dude. He's going to play in the NFL. And my mother said, what's the NFL? <laughs> and Dr. Lemaire said, the Patriots. He's going to play for the Patriots. And she said, oh my god, 
my son's going to play for the Patriots. Like, she, it was, she was so, like, this is actually going to happen. So every single day of my life, talk about planting that seed, right? These are all lessons that we're doing in our business, in our coaching, in everything we do to inspire people. My mother not knowing anything because that doctor told her that her son was going to play for the Patriots. When I would walk in the room, she would go, Mark Magna for the Patriots. And I'd go, what is wrong with you? I'm not playing for the Patriots. This guy's 6'4", 250. It's not real. She's like, you will. She didn't know anything about sports. She said, you will. Every single day. And I started to believe it. I really started to believe it. So I became obsessed with training. And my grandfather, Abe White, saw me you know, being picked on by other kids and being depressed and locking myself in my, my room. My brothers and I, we shared a room. We, and he came over one day and he said, what's wrong? And I said, you know, I get bullied by the other kids and I don't want to go to school because I, I freaking hate it. I just hate it. And he goes, well, what would make you feel better? He said, I like to kick their ass. That's what I like to do. So he goes, come with me. And he took me to the local boys club. And he took out $19. And he bought me a membership to the boys club with $19. And he trained me. And my grandfather had tr a training background. My grandfather trained the first ever Mr. Universe competitor. His name was Everett Sinderhoff. And my grandfather showed me how to train. And an interesting story, after the first day, it hurt so bad and it was so torturous. The next day when he came to pick me up, I said, tell grandpa I can't go. Just tell him I can't go. And he said, he came up the stairs, grabbed me and said, we have to go back. I said, well, how many days are we gonna do this, this week? And he says, we're gonna do it every single day. So he was one of my great coaches, believed in me. Um, he was actually my father's, my father's father died when he was young. He was a stepfather. Uh, he was a Jewish World War II veteran, one of the greatest men I ever met. So I had to pay him respect by telling that piece. Okay. That's him on the left right there, Abe White. He was actually a, a basketball coach scorer in our town for 53 years as well. Um, so I'm in high school, and I'm, and I'm training like crazy, and I'm, I'm hitting the weight room, and I go to the track at night, and I hop the fence, I go to the track in the morning, certainly overtraining, certainly under-recovered, and I'm loving it because I just felt like that was the right thing to do, and it was a way for me to channel all my energy. And I, I harnessed it, and I started working and digging, and I'm watching these NFL films, and, I, and I'm on the field, and I'm doing all my steps, I'm doing my pass rush moves, spin moves, and the security guard for the high school would watch me at night. He was a huge man named Andy Hickman. And slowly but surely, my skill set started to come together. My understanding of football started to come together. I still wasn't a great player, but I loved the game so much because that's where I felt comfortable. Giving effort, working hard, doing my best being a great teammate, supporting others. I was supporting others because I wanted to be supported. So my head coach, Bob Bogan, that's not him, by the way. My head coach, Bob Bogan, <laughs> said, Mark, I want to tell you this one piece of information that you need to hold on for the rest of your life. I want you to understand that you have to give 100% effort all the time. And I said, well, I, I do that, right? I said, but why do you think I have to do that? He goes, because you're not very good. He goes, you're not very good. So if you don't give great effort, then you're really bad. But if you give great effort, that clears up a lot of rough spots, kind of like what we do every day in business, right? Kind of like what we do with our clients. If we show up early, if we stay late, if we do some extra cleaning, we do some extra planning, like that cleans up a lot of rough spots. Give 100% effort. It's going to mean a lot. I did that. I did that, and that gentleman in the middle was the defensive coordinator for the University of Richmond, and he's one of the greatest men slash coaches I was ever around, and he came to town, and someone said, you gotta come by and see this guy Mark Magna play. So he comes by, I don't know he's there, he's in the stands, and he's watching me play, and he told me this story many years later, because he's still you know, one of my heroes and a good, you know, powerful person in my life. He said, Mark, I was sitting there, you weren't, playing very, uh, you weren't playing very well, I decided to get up and I'm walking out. As I'm walking out, 
there was a play where the tailback, Garth Kamara from Stang High School, ran a sweep. So he took a false step this way, and of course I bit on it, and I took a step, I fell on my chest, and I fell down, and I, I took a second, and I said, fuck. I just got up and I started sprinting downfield. I sprinted downfield 40 yards, I just dove and pulled this kid down from behind. And I remember thinking, I can't freaking believe I caught that kid. I couldn't believe it. This guy came down to the locker room after the game, he walked right up to me, and he was like, son, I want to tell you something. You have a full scholarship to the University of Richmond. And I was excited, and Bob Bogan said, this is amazing. You have to call your mother. So I called my mother, and I said, Mom, I got a full scholarship to the University of Richmond. She goes, who told you that? <laughs> and I said, uh, this, this little guy, his name is Jim Reed, because he was short. And she goes, put Coach Bogan on the phone. I said, Coach, she wants to talk to you. He goes, yes, Mrs. Magna. She was tough, like no one wanted to talk to Mrs. Magna. She goes, Mrs. Magna, yes. He goes, why did you tell Mark that? He goes, I didn't tell him. Uh, Coach Reed told him um, he's going to University of Richmond. He goes, but I don't think we can do that. And I said, Coach, we can't afford that. Because I wasn't aware that a scholarship pays for everything. Like, I didn't know. So I said, I don't think she's going to let me go. She's not going to let me go. So. <laughs> I say, how far away is that? She says, it's like 600 miles. I said, I don't know if my mom's going to be down with that. It's far. So as soon as I got home and I walked in the room and I said, they're going to pay for it and I can go. They're going to pay for my education. It's amazing. It was a very emotional moment. First person in my family to get a scholarship to go to college. So this is the guy right here, Jim Reed, that believed in me. And he was such a powerful figure. He might have been 5'7". He'd kill me if I said that, but it's true but he walked like he was seven feet tall. He really walked like he was seven feet tall, and he told me, you're gonna go to University of Richmond and talk about casting a vision. He's like, you're gonna be a starter, you're gonna be a captain, you're gonna be an all-conference player, you're gonna be an All-American. And I said, and I'm gonna play in the NFL, right? And he goes, hmm. <laughs> He's like, let's just start there, let's start there. I said, okay, coach, the first day, first day there, <laughs> We're doing drills, I got my equipment, I'm running around like a crazy person, I'm loving life. He goes, Mark, you're gonna go stand over there with the defensive lineman. And I said, okay, I, I, I stand with the defensive lineman. <laughs> then I said, coach, when am I gonna go back to be a linebacker? He said, never. He said, you're a defensive lineman. And I'm not sure if you follow football or not, but do I look like a defensive lineman? No. no. Not only was I a defensive lineman, I was a nose guard. <laughs> I, and I'm like, this guy must really hate me because when you're in the trenches and you're getting double teamed by 315, 320 pounders, it sucks. It sucks. So I walked into his office. I said, Coach, we, we have to talk because I can't, I can't be a defensive lineman. Like I, I'm, look, at the time I weighed about 225 pounds. I said, I'm built to be a linebacker. That's my dream. LT, Derek Thomas, that's me. He goes, you're going to be a defensive lineman. Shut the door. Get out of my office. I'm like, man, I hate Coach Reed now. Hate his guts. And the reason I hated his guts is because once you're a defensive lineman, you go to that guy. And that's Joe Cullen, who is now the defensive coordinator for the Jacksonville Jaguars. He's also the same guy who's been arrested twice for drunk and disorderly. And one time he drove through the Wendy's drive through naked. <laughs> so that's the personal stuff. You're laughing, but he's just as crazy when he, when he coaches. Who's seen the movie Whiplash? Raise your hand. What? Joe, look around. You haven't seen it either. You guys need to watch Whiplash. Seriously, Whiplash. And it talks about a music teacher who's just insane, but he believes in his heart that if he's really hard on his kids, he's going to make them great. This guy was that guy on steroids. Like, he was batshit crazy. You know when you do a drill, you screw up, he makes you do it again, right? 20 times. Stopping practice, embarrassing you. You don't do a good job after 20 times, he makes you go stand in the woods on a chair facing the other direction with your helmet on and your mouthpiece in. And he was a lunatic. He'd walk in film room, slam his fist, and just go crazy. He would never, ever, ever let you have a moment, meaning like, great job, there was no great job, there was no that of boys. And I'm not saying that's the best way. I don't believe in that anymore. But this guy was one of the greatest coaches I've ever met. He wanted every kid that no other position coach wanted because he knew he could take 
any rock and get water from it. And if he couldn't, man, you were going to suffer. You were going to suffer miserably. So I played nose guard and then in three technique, and I worked my way as a senior to uh, defensive end. I played all three. So I ended up, because of those two guys, playing for four years, starting every game. And I went from a kid who got one scholarship offer to a first-team All-American leading the nation in sacks and setting a school record for sacks in a season and sacks in a career. But because of those two guys, because they believed in me, and I did everything they said. It didn't matter if they were good coaches. It didn't matter if they told me to run with a chair around the track, a chair above my head. They, I did it all. And I, I was just so happy that someone freaking believed in me. Side note, that guy, I think I might have to I told someone this last night, but the guy in the middle was a psychology. He had books behind his desk. He knew how to get to every athlete. I remember being in the locker room, and I, I asked one of the running backs, I said, hey, um, does your father come to the games? He goes, I don't know my father, it's just my mom. How about you, does your father come to the games? He goes, mom, I, I never met my dad. And we had a locker room full of kids that had no fathers. And I was thinking, this guy's a genius. He's so smart because now he was the father figure and we would do anything to please him. I didn't realize that, like everything he did was to get inside the mind of what drives you. Steve said it before, why are you doing this? Why is this important to you? He knew that I would rather die than give up. And that's the only reason he gave me a scholarship. That's what we do today. Why do you keep showing up every morning? Why do you keep showing up early for your business? Why do you keep going all in, paying it extra attention to detail? Because it's important to you, your history, your DNA. When I was a, uh, a freshman at the University of Richmond, it was so hard for me. I had a 1.6 GPA and I was the third string defensive lineman. I wasn't gonna play. I called my mother and I said, Mom, I, I, can't, I can't be here. Like, it's too hard. I'm not that smart. I didn't do that well in high school. Now I'm in these classes with all these great students. I'm not playing, I'm the worst athlete out here. Like, I have to come home. I didn't wanna let her down, but I was just being honest with her, I have to come home. Complete silence on the phone. It seemed like 20 minutes, it was probably 30 seconds. She said, you know that you can come home right now. If you come home right now, we'll never talk about it again. But if you decide to give up a scholarship and give up the opportunity that you have right now that no one else in our family has ever had, you're going to regret it every day for the rest of your life, I promise you. So even if it doesn't go well, you can't give up. You just can't give up. And my mother sat down, and it's something that I do today. I write letters to some of our team members. She sat down and she wrote a letter, and at the end of the letter, she had a yellow post-it. She wrote, dream big, never quit. She got it out of Reader's Digest, no doubt. But I took that letter to heart, and I was thinking, I oh, mean, I can't let her down, man. She raised two boys by herself, three jobs, drove me across that bridge, playing football when I was a kid, and she wants me to have a better life. So I can't let her down. That's the letter, that's her, I still have that, I have that framed at the house. I had it in a, my business partner said, bro, you need to frame this. Because it was like in a, in a pin behind my desk and he framed it for me and actually gave it to me. And um, that's me at like 260 pounds with a fractured elbow and I had like five sacks in that game. And uh, Coach Cullen, that freaking lunatic guy, he goes, are you in pain? I said, Coach, I'm in so much pain. He goes, you know the only thing worse than a grizzly bear? I said, what, coach? He goes, a wounded grizzly. I'm like, this guy's a fucking idiot. <laughs> I said, I'm in real pain. But, but he, he would never let me have that moment. And um, the point is, it went very well, because I believed in those coaches. They believed in me. And um, I started to uh, gain attention. And the irony is that, look, my college coaches said I was too small to be a linebacker. Now I'm getting attention from college scouts. And they're like, we're going to move him to linebacker. I think he can play linebacker. And every time I heard that, I would go back to coaches and say, they want me to be a linebacker. You told me I couldn't do it. They want me to be a linebacker. And I trained for the combine by myself. I, I went to the library. I gave him my driver's license. They gave me this camcorder that was as big as this TV screen. It was huge. 
and I would put it on the field, and I'd do all these drills. Combine programs didn't really exist then. I'm 45 years old. And um, I would record all the drills, the shuttle, my start of the 40, everything you could possibly, the three cone. I recorded everything. I trained every single day. I did the 225 test almost every single day. And when the scouts came, I wasn't invited to the combine. Excuse me. I wasn't invited to the combine, so we had a pro day. And um, I had to do the 225 max effort rep test like every single day. Like scout showed up. One scout showed up. I wasn't the kind of kid that got 50 scouts to show up. One guy showed up, 225. I had to do the test. Oh, man. The next day, tired, fatigued, probably shouldn't do a max effort every day, I'm doing it again. One day, Coach Reed walked in and told all the scouts he's not doing anything else because he's been testing for each team every day. Yeah, that's the reason he's running a 4.8 now, because he's been running 40s every day. Science. So he shut that down. I waited for a draft day, and um, I honestly didn't think I would get drafted. And um, I, I lived in this room in the... Uh, it's called Robbins Hall, the athletic facility, where there was a mattress on the floor, and there was a phone jack in there, believe it or not, and I gave that number to the scouts. First day came around, no call. Second day, I, I got a call. And I picked up the phone, and I said, this is Mark Megna, and he said, do you know who this is, son? And in that moment, I heard that voice. It's weird, because you've never had a conversation with someone, but you kind of figure out who it is. I actually knew who it was, and I didn't know what pick they were on. He said, this is Bill Parcells. I'm the head coach of the New York Jets. And I was like, hey, coach. And uh, he said, Mark, I'm thinking about taking you with this next pick. Do you think you can play linebacker for me? I was like, yes, sir. He goes, you think you can rush the passer for me in third, third downs? I was like, yes, sir. I'll kill it. He goes, do you think you can be a great special teams player for me. I was like, sure, I'll do whatever I have to do. So they drafted me, sixth round. Uh, man, it's weird. Sixth round, I went to the New York Jets, and I thought I was going to be a Jet. Went to camp, all gun-ho, and doing everything I'm supposed to do. And I, all the linebackers there, the four starters were all pro linebackers. It was James Farrier, Brian Cox, uh, Marvin Jones, who was one of my heroes, and uh, Mo Lewis. Mo Lewis, if anyone knows who Mo Lewis is, I'm sure some of the older guys in the back know, but he was like 6'5", 280. He was a linebacker. And every time he took his shirt off, I was like, Jesus. He looks like a professional bodybuilder. What's going on here? But that was my first experience. Uh, lo and behold, I, I played in all the preseason games, and I got cut. And talk about crying. Man, I cried. I, I, I cried, and super depressed, and I, I'm a big believer in, in, in things work out. I'm a big believer in God and, and just have faith. When I was done crying, the phone rang, and it was the New England Patriots. <laughs> and they were like, hey, man, we're going to sign you. And I was like, shit, this is amazing. I'm so happy I got cut. But <laughs> it was like worst to first, right? So I went to New England, and... My first coach wasn't Coach Belichick, it was actually Pete Carroll. And Pete Carroll was completely different from those two guys. Completely different. I can't tell you how opposed they were with the way they thought, the way they coached. All great coaches, but I played for Pete for one year, and then um, this guy came in. And he was actually my coordinator in New York. And I've, I was mesmerized by this guy. Just the way he went about everything. When you walk in his office, he had this giant stereo system. And he loved Bon Jovi. Bon Jovi was always at our practices. And he would blast rock music. And he had these things. I have a pad back there. He had these things. He's called the pads. And there were so many notes on the pads. And this guy, Coach Belichick, didn't miss a beat. He never missed a beat. Like, ever. It was, he knew... You know, Mark, you realize you're always the last one to line up on the ball? Like, you know, he's got like 12 assistant coaches. He knows more than all of them. He knows everything. The receiver runs the, runs the route, supposed to come back to the six, six yards. They run seven. He writes down on the pad. He goes, you're always at seven yards. He knows. He sees everything. His mind in football acumen is so high and so much experience. I think when I got there, he had like 41 years of experience in the NFL. 
41 years. So next time you like want it to happen overnight, you're not getting immediate gratification or instant gratification, think of that. Remember, this guy, when he was with the Browns, people used to make fun of him. When he was with the Giants, people used to make fun of him. Arguably, I believe, the greatest NFL coach that ever lived, they didn't trust him. They didn't want to use his system. They didn't think he was that smart. On the books, on the record, Lawrence Taylor would pick on him and make fun of him. And then with the defensive schemes, when Lawrence Taylor started to be productive and get sacks, he loved him. So sometimes that's the way the relationship goes. But I learned more about paying attention to detail in running an organization and running a business by these guys because they're in charge of what time the bus is supposed to get there, what time the bus is supposed to leave, what's going to be on the training table at night. We're going to do chapel, we're going to do Bible study, and we're going to do a, another thing called conference where we're just going to talk about issues. It's going to be free, open format. They understand everything, that boiling pot of culture. They understand it. If someone's toxic, they know, get them out of here immediately. Get them out. Just get them out of the room. And I, I was enamored by Bill Belichick. I was also super impressed with the little smallest detail that he shared with different players. He said, the next time that running back comes out to block you, run right over his face. He can't block you. So he would tell me that. We'd run right over his face. And then i look back at him, and he'd go. <laughs> and, but the interesting thing about him, like when, when we're running our businesses, you're running your, your whatever it is, your training, your, you're trying to grow your business. The one takeaway that I have that I can share with you that you should never, ever, ever forget is that every single decision that he makes is to keep it moving forward. Keep it moving forward. I remember Ty Law was the best cornerback in the NFL. He signed a huge contract. Well, he came in. The first thing he did was he cut Ty Law. I was like, oh, my God, he cut Ty Law. Our defense is going to suck. Why would he do that? He's the best cornerback in the NFL. Willie McGinnis turned and he looked at me. He goes, because Ty doesn't have the best attitude. And Coach Bill knows that it's not going to help us. Whatever Ty does is going to help him, and he doesn't want that here. He's looking for guys to what? Do their job and keep things moving forward. So I, I, I think, I don't know if this is going to play, but so here's a clip that, shows what you're about to see is Mark getting his first sack in the NFL. Any person in this room could have done what I'm about to do. I'm very serious. I run off the edge and I smack the quarterback. That's not the point. I'm going to ask you what the point is after you view this. Oh, no. All right, thank you. the edge hit someone in the mouth. What was the problem with that play? Be honest, you can say it. Say it louder. Didn't knock the ball loose. So I was so happy. I got up and Coach Bill's right there and I, I need to go to the bench there. But what am I going to do? I'm walking by him. I'm walking by him because I know I'm going to get a that a boy or a great job, Mark. And as I walk him, I pull my shoulder pads down and I go, He looks at me, he covers up his mic, and I swear to God, he goes, come on, Mark, you got to get the fucking ball out. And I was like, <laughs> I was like, dude, I just ended the drive, the game's over. Willie McGinnis is sitting on the bench, he just looks at me, he goes, he's right. <laughs> and I, but he is right. Like, and that was so great because it, it was never enough. There's always a way you can improve. Every time my ego gets in the way and I'm like, man, I'm doing a great job. Anatomy's killing it. I'm like, I'm missing something. There's something that I'm missing. There's a way to be better. And the second I start patting myself on the back, I realize there's a problem here. You, ju you just, you can't see it. You're not paying attention to detail. So 
uh, when I finished playing professional football, I went right to work to be a trainer. And I was already training people. I went from the NFL to the CFL, and I was training guys on the team. And I loved writing programs and putting guys through the paces. So when I moved to Miami, I started training people. I'm wearing a cast there because I tore my meniscus and I had surgery. And the doc was like, hey, man, get off your feet for eight weeks. And I was like, hey, man, I can't do that. So I'm wearing a cast. Uh, Side note, when I got to Miami after playing professional football, I did that thing that all athletes do, and I took care of everyone in my family, which is interesting because come full circle, I had to take care of myself, and I spent a lot of money. So I was in an apartment with two roommates, one former Marine and one law student at the University of Miami. And I remember getting on Craigslist, standing in line, because it was Miami, there was a line of 12 people in front of me waiting to be seen to get this other room in this apartment. It was very humbling. So I went to work at Equinox. I'm living with roommates, and I'm cranking out sessions, man. And I'm you know, trying to build my client roster and doing everything I need to do. And this is when I built up that habit where I said, man, what the hell happened with my life? Why am I here? What's going on? I can't believe I failed this badly. And it's all perspective, right? I thought I failed because I was grinding, hate that word, but it's what the kids say, grinding, and I'm just banging out sessions. And I went home one night, it's 10.30 at night, and the former Marine, Jason Geary, looks at me and he goes, what's wrong? I'm like, dude, I'm working like from 5 a.m. to 10 o'clock at night. I don't feel like I'm, I'm, I'm making a dent or making an impact. He goes, brother, are you helping people? I said, yeah, I'm helping people. He goes, all you need to do is take the things that got you to where you were in the NFL and apply them to your everyday life, and you will have even more success doing this. So I started to do that. And I said, I don't care what it takes. I don't care what the job is. I'm going to do a great job. I'm going to go all in, and I'm going to give everything I have. I'm going to give every ounce of energy in my body, and we're going to see what happens. And, uh, and I remember we had 26 trainers there, and we had a, had a nail in the back with all the name tags of the trainers. And every time someone quit, we'd put the name tag on the, on the board. And it was like hundreds of people. I was there for almost nine years or uh, it was a long time, and the first week I was there, the GM took a towel, and he goes, hey, man, do me a favor, go clean the floor, and he thought I was like this cocky NFL guy, and I was like, okay. I was like, I grabbed the towel, and I always say, my first reaction was, man, I'm thinking of creative ways to kill this dude, right? <laughs> I have two choices. I can go all in and do a good job on this like I really try to do with everything in my life, or I can let my ego take over and say, I'm too good for this and quit. So he gives me the towel, and he's kind of, you know, got this smirk on his face, and I get down, and I start, like, and I take the water out, and I pour the water on the thing, and I'm scrubbing the thing. He's like, Mark, what the hell are you doing? I'm like, you told me to clean the floor. I said, I'm trying to clean the floor, but I'm going to need something else because this floor looks like shit. I don't know whose job it was before, but I'm going to do a better job, so why don't you go grab me that stuff while I work on this, and we'll make some progress. So he never told me to clean the floor again. <laughs> so I realized that my attitude is going to determine my success. I know you've heard it a million times. It's nothing new, but I didn't care about anything else. All I cared about was doing a good job, serving the people in front of me, and trying to add value to their life. All I knew is that I wanted them to have the same experience with gyms, training, and improving their mental health and wellness that I had growing up. And if I could do that and serve them, things will work out. I realized that my entire life was about me. It really was. I was the most selfish person in the world, and it took me my entire life to unpack the shit to realize it's not about me. Check your ego. Stop being an asshole and try to help other people. So the second I started to actually do that, things started to change for me drastically. And that was me kind of starting. That was me when I was into it, and I'm probably doing pay periods two weeks. I was probably doing... Uh, anywhere from 100 sessions to 120 sessions of pay period. 
and I was working at a performance facility, and I was training a couple privates outside. And the reason I could train privates outside and they didn't say anything to me is because I was like top 10 in the country of Equinox banging out sessions. So they didn't care. I could do whatever I wanted to do. And one day I got a call from the guy on the right, and he said, hey, I want you to train me for the off season. I said, off season of what? He said, baseball. I said, that's, what do you play? Like softball in Flamingo Park down the street? And he goes, no, I play uh, for the New York Yankees. I said, you play for the New York Yankees? He goes, yeah, I play for the Yankees. My name's Alex. He was like, I told my wife, I said, I think I'm talking to Alex Rodriguez. So I started to train Alex, and I trained him every day, and I went to Germany with him uh, as well to train and to see Dr. Peter Wheeling, the guy who created a PRP. And I spent a lot of time with this dude. I remember watching, you know, you can think whatever you want about Alex Rodriguez, but one thing that he did when he stepped up to that plate was that dude was focused. Like super, super focused. I remember being in his home and he had this thing about this big above the living room and there was a tee and I would take the balls out and I would just put the balls on the tee and he would swing. And you could hear it in the crack of that bat, man. This was different. When he took, a, when he took that salt and swing, it was like this sweet crack and he would do that hundreds of times. Hundreds of times, the same thing. The same thing. And I realized that, man, if I can make an impact with a guy like that, I can do general population. I can help anyone. It really started to take off for me. So in my ninth year, one of my dear friends who was a uh, sports agent, he said, hey, man, you got to do something else. You got to really try to like do your thing and, 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 and just bring this to the masses because you can't be doing this all day. You're going to die. You don't sleep. It's not good for you. So I said, what am I supposed to do? He said, well, I have a friend that's trying to open up a gym, uh, a spa, a beautiful spa, and you want to open up a gym. You guys should come together. Maybe you have something really special there. So I went to meet this guy named Chris. We sat down. We talked for like three hours. And he said he wanted to create this awesome concept in a, a luxury place where we help people and just give awesome service. And the most important person in the room is not you, it's the other person. I was like, man, this sounds great. So we came up with this concept called anatomy. And the anatomy name came from, didn't come from Mark, didn't come from Chris. It came from a construction worker on the site. We said, um, we don't know what to call it. We got this service. There was 5,000 names in there. And we, Miami Fitness Factory, you know, the, the, you know, training center, all this crap that sucked. And this construction worker said, hey, what is this going to be? And we said, it's going to be a gym. He said, oh, yeah? You should call it anatomy. And I was like, anatomy? That's the dumbest name I've ever heard in my life. Stupid. We got in the car and drove away. Chris called me that night and goes, you know, that's a pretty good name. Like, anatomy, it doesn't really sound that bad. It's kind of cool. What do you think? I'm like, yeah, it is pretty kind of cool. So construction worker named it. Maybe I don't think he even knows that. OK. The, the mission was to create this ridiculous team and culture, which means who's the person in your life you care the most about? Kids. Kids, OK. Who's the person you care the most about in your life? That's amazing. It's awesome. Your significant other, your kids, your mom, your father, someone close to you that you love. When someone walks in, you got to treat that person like they're your mom, your father, your brother, the person you care about most. That's what's going to matter most, really. And if they feel that, that's what they remember. We're all talking about the same shit. I know that. Every time Luca talks, Jay talks, Steve talks, I go, fucking guy stole my shit. He didn't steal anything. That's the way it's supposed to be. There's a reason we talk like that. We talk like that because we've been through a lot of shit and we get, you can know all the technique stuff in the world, biomechanics, FRC, all the stuff in training. And I was in certs and I went to everything CEUs, Martin Rooney, and I was like, the reason that stands out and sticks with me is because that's what matters most. And the reason people don't focus on it is because it's fucking hard. It's super hard, and then it's even harder to do that every day. And when I speak at things like this, they go, well, how long do I have to do that for? I go, forever. Forever. That's why it's so hard. Super hard. So 
you, you know, you show up Monday through Friday, it's Saturday, Sunday. They go, why do you work Saturday and Sunday? Because the gym's open, man. The gym's open, so I have to be there. The reason I get up at 3.15 a.m. every morning is because I expect my people to show up at 5 a.m. every morning. If I get up at 5 a.m., they're going to show up at 7. If I don't do it, if I don't behave that way, if my actions don't show that, it's impossible. That's why leadership is so hard, because you have to do it all the time, and you do it under the watchful eye of everyone in front of you. And the second you don't do it right, they're going to go, he's not living it. They're right. They're absolutely right. So this is the anatomy way. Each person is a uh, unique personality and strengths to the team, which brings diversity and power to the team. We're not trying to get people to conform just to that. The anatomy way simply is be a better person. Be a good person. Be a great human. Help others. To go back, go back, go back. Please. OK. Together, there is a collective mindset that translates to shared behaviors working towards achieving a common goal. So we're all focused on fitness and wellness. And we're all going the same way. You ever seen that diagram? A straight line, that's the best way, but we probably do this. We're all going to get there. How we get there, that's really up to us. That's why we recruit certain people, because I like the diversity. I like different. I don't want people to be like me. I want you to be like you, but I want you to be the best version of yourself. And then if we put all those people together, when Luca and all these guys walk in, they go, man, it's pretty cool there. People are nice. They're all unique. They're all diversified. That's the goal. Oh, by the way, let me go back. This is Andrew Calori. Can you go back? OK. Andrew Calori didn't apply to anatomy because he thought he wasn't good enough to work there. He was also a trainer for the New York uh, Giants. And when he told me that story when he walked in, I was thinking, whew, I'm glad you walked in. Because he's our head trainer. He's in charge of uh, Midtown. And he helps me with the hiring. He's a tremendous human being. And the way he behaved, meaning the way he is, his attitude, humbleness, no gossip, no BS, cares about people, empathy, he is the model. That's a fake smile, though. <laughs> our mission. Be honest, do your best, work with passion, serve others, treat everyone with respect. Sounds easy, super hard to do, super hard to do. I just got a call at our break that someone in our organization who's a world-class performer did something that was dishonest. We have to have a talk with that guy because we can't keep people who are going to crush the system. We just can't. It's going to be a tough talk, too, man, but it is what it is. Coach Rooney said it. You have to hold everyone accountable. It's super important. The second you don't hold everyone accountable, they're going to go, yeah, but you didn't tell him to do it. Like, that's, that's not fair. You treat everyone different. <coughs> do your best. At the end of the day, I tell everyone, look yourself in the mirror and ask yourself, was that your best? Tell you a quick story. One of my top, top, top body architects runs over to me one morning. He's like, Mark, Mark, the Versa Climb is broke. It's in my programming. I got to do it. I don't know what happened to it. I saw you on it this morning. You must have broke it. What's going on? I said, Oh my God, the Versa Climb is broke. I walk over. I look at the plug, look on the ground, look at him. I pick it up. I plug it in. I say, Did you exhaust all your resources to fix that thing? He didn't say anything. <laughs> Do your best. You know what your best is. I don't know what your best is. We have a young man on the team. He's like, man, I'm doing my best. I said, well, then here's the thing. Your best isn't good enough for me. And I think you got more in you. And if this is your best, this might not be the best place for you. He goes, what do you mean? I'm like, because this is the person we know. I know your mother or father or someone important in your life told you that you had greatness inside you. But if this is your version of greatness, it's not for me. I'm being honest. I'm not trying to be mean. I'm not trying to be a jerk. I'm not trying to be an asshole. But if you're telling me that you can't give more and you can't try harder, that's saying a lot. I need to know that you can try harder. One of the questions we ask in the interview process is, hey, man, tell me about a couple of your strengths. And they start talking about, oh, man, I'm good at this. And I'm good at communicating my coaching, cueing, my programming is on point. It's sick. It's amazing, which is all a setup for the second thing. Tell me what you're not good at. What's the most challenging thing for you? What do you want to be better at? 
I shit you not, in interviews, we just did an interview uh, with a girl in Australia. She said, she, she's actually accepted, she's gonna be on the team. Amazing, amazing energy, amazing interview. We'll see, it's always 50-50. She said, Mark, can I be honest with you? There's so many things I'm not good at, I don't have enough time to tell you. I was like, perfect, this person is perfect. You know why? Because they know they can be better. I asked another kid, what, what do you want to be good at? What, what's your challenge? He's like, ah, oh, man, shit, it's a good question. Mm. I don't know, man. It's a, I'll be honest with you, I'm pretty good at a lot of everything. And I was like, ooh, <laughs> man, shit, I'm on the wrong call. Not someone for us. Why? Because if you have to give that person feedback, do you think they're going to be open to feedback? No, they're not going to be open to feedback. You, sometimes when, you, when we're giving feedback, they're like, man, you're coming down to me. This isn't right. I, I don't feel good. Uh, you know, it's not respect. I, how you deliver it's important, and we're going to talk about that. But I always say, do you think it helps us for you not to succeed? No. Do you think that we get great joy in this process? No. But you have to understand that if it's not going well, we are going to jump in. Because at times when you say, hey, you know, I'm good, or you don't say anything, or you don't ask questions, what do we assume? That you have all the answers. You have to speak up. And if I see someone not doing well, we have to jump in and help them get up that hill, right? One of my coaches, that coach Jim Reed, would always tell me, hey, Mark, anything worthwhile is uphill. It's going to be hard. And the people that you bring in, no one's going to walk through the door for your business having 100% of the skill set. It's going to take energy. It's going to take energy units. And at Anatomy, we're not in the fitness business. We're in the people development business. That's a huge part. And they don't even know what's going on. In team meetings, they do presentations. The presentations just so they work in their PowerPoint. They, do, they, do, they have to do public speaking. We do table topics. You know what table topics are? Table topics, I asked a question. I said, the most embarrassing situation in my life was when I was in kindergarten. We were doing the you know, uh, Pledge of Allegiance, and I wet my pants. What was your most embarrassing moment? And I go, Luca, so you don't know what's coming. So it's impromptu speaking. So now they get to get up on stage, engage the person on stage, shake their hand, look them in the eye, talk, talk, speak, speak, give a great speech for two minutes, and then leave the stage. So it's super uncomfortable. That's the intention. That's why we do it. So people development. We do presentations. We do life stories. That's one of the most impactful things we do at our in our organization, you have to put together a PowerPoint that lasts one hour of your life story. I call it the true Hollywood story. And you have to talk about your life and how you got there. And everyone does it. Joe did it. He had uh, intro music when he did it. Jersey Joe. A few of the things that we try to push every day, over communication. It's hard to make mistakes when everyone is in the know. Uh, look, it's a lot of emails, a lot of texts, it's a lot of calls, it's a lot of Zoom calls, but we make sure we over-communicate. We have Jacqueline Kaysen, who's phenomenal. Jacqueline Kaysen is head of group fitness. I'll ask her, how is the spin studio doing? It's good. Okay. Is it painted? Yes. Are the bikes in there? Yes. Is the sound in? No. When is the sound being fixed? I'll get on it. When is the sound being fixed? Uh, I'll find out. Okay. Later in the day. Did you send the email? Yes. That's what it is all day all day, and that's one person, and that's one of our best leaders. Sense of urgency, do you have a sense of urgency? Hey, can you please do this for me? Sure, I'll do that. No, 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 do it now. Do it right now, go do it right now. In between, we were in between sessions, I said, Joe, I'm sending you this person, you need to reach out to him right now. He said, okay, he called that person immediately. Attention to detail, just like the Coach Belichick story. We've heard this a thousand times, but ask yourself, do you pay attention to detail? Do you pay attention to detail? Enthusiasm. Enthusiasm to me is everything. I absolutely love what I do. I love it, I do it all day, and I'm surrounded by people who love it in the same way. We love it because we're helping people, and we all have that story. We all have a story to give what we have to other people, to give that awesome, awesome fitness wellness journey. Because let's be honest, we train, we train every day. When you don't train, how do you feel? We feel like shit. The secret is we know that, they don't know that, we're trying to give them that. <coughs> do more, small fires create little heat. Go above and beyond. This is where we create real value and momentum. Go beyond whatever it is. Look, 
We had a guy came in, forgot his suit. He had a business meeting early in the morning. He said, Mark, I can't train. I said, why can't you train? I forgot my suit. I said, perfect. I know exactly where you live. We have this young man. He's going to go to your apartment. He's going to get your suit. He's going to bring it back so you can train. I don't have shoes. What size are you? Size 13. Here are my shoes. Just give them to him. Whatever. But that's for everyone. So these are anatomy absolutes. This is uh, one of my favorite coaches growing up. Do the right things. Do your best, best you can, and always show people that you care. The way you do anything is the way you do everything. Care about people. Be friendly and smile. Man, smile. Just smile. Offer cheerful greetings, pleasant goodbyes. When people walk into the facility, sometimes we scream their name, stop the music, and start clapping just because. Treat everyone with respect. Maintain a safe haven. Will Smith told me this personally. The reason I keep coming back in here is because no one sticks a camera in front of my face. I said, that's amazing. I said, if anyone sticks a camera in front of your face, please let me know. <laughs> Create a great energetic environment. Be passionate about our calling. Acknowledge everyone with enthusiasm. Represent anatomy with pride. Dress for success. We have a dress code. Unacceptable behavior. And I've dealt with this with great productive people. Constant criticism, demeaning, Non-subtle, non-verbal cues, passive-aggressive remarks, minimizing, clicks in friendship. These are all, I'm not going to go over the whole list. Actions that divide the team, just can't have it. Can't have it. And I've had to let go of some, my mentor told me, Mark, the success of your business will depend on who you fire or who you fail to fire. Hardest lesson I ever got. I had to fire one of my best friends. Social media, I'm going to skip that because I'm certainly not an expert. This is little Jose. We talk about culture. Everyone throws the culture word around. This is what culture means to me. That's just the definition that, that I pull. But when these guys walk into our facilities in Miami, they have to automatically feel that this place is different. If I have to sit down and explain what culture is, it's probably not a very good culture. Culture is, hey, what's up, brother? How you doing today? What are you training? I'm training this. Do you want me to get that uh, bar for you? No, I got it. OK, cool. You're changing the weights. I'm here. You're changing weights here. I see you're on a trap bar. I turn around. I put the weights on. I don't want to thank you. I don't want anything. I'm just doing it because that's what we do. That's what culture is, caring about the person. We had a kid, came to Miami, working for Anatomy, so excited to be there. His wife tells him, I want a divorce. We all rush to this guy's support just to be there for him because we knew how awful he was going to feel. That's culture. It's not just the high fives and the hellos. I love the high fives and the hellos. I'm all about it. But I want to be there for people when no one else is. That's important to me. Our culture maintains a clear set of standards and expectations. It's founded on respect, maturity, self, selflessness, love. Does not tolerate excuses or any other form of complaining. We're in the service industry. We're here to help others. That's David Geller. He's our COO and partner now, bottom right. Harvard graduate, one of the smartest guys they've ever met. But he's also one of the most caring guys they've ever met. We wouldn't be here without him. He's a tremendous person, tremendous. Everything we do here at Anatomy and the culture we strive to build is to serve our team members first, then our community. Please remember, without our members, we cannot exist. It's all about the experience. That's Brandon Price. He's going to be our head of education. He's terrific. Uh, it's Megan Sketch. That's her Instagram handle, Sketch. She's hilarious. Andrew, once again, and our boxing instructors, Paula and Jorge. I got to play this, customer service, because every time we have something that goes wrong, I, I was just downstairs, and I had these two little things of matcha. And I said, hey, man, can you put this in some almond milk for me so I could drink this before my presentation? She was like, man, I can't do that. I can't put any foreign substances in our cups. And I was thinking, oh, God, I felt so bad. Good kid. I'm sure she was following the rules. But I, was, I immediately was thinking about this. You're trying to follow the rules, but I'm watching you, right? Can we play that?
Hold on. I'm going backwards, right? Hold on. Hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. It's not just, a, it's not just self-promotion here. How do I go back? All right, st st stop. The next one, Steve. I just want to thank these people in my life. Um, all coaches, all people who went out of their way to help me when they didn't want to help me, uh, excuse me, when, when, I, when they didn't have time to help me, rather, but all incredible people who contribute to why I'm standing up here today. Running a business is the hardest thing I've ever done outside of growing up with very little money, very little food, the NFL. This is a vicious, I call it a vicious animal, and I'm doing everything I can to contribute to keeping this thing going in the most positive way. We didn't start anatomy to sell it. We started anatomy to help people, and we want to grow it to be as big as possible, but with quality. We don't franchise, we're not interested in that. We just want to give a great product to change people's lives. And that's why I'm here today. Seriously, you can all do the same thing. I have no doubt anyone wants to open up a gym, I always say, you should do it. But be prepared. Don't be married to what it looks like, get to know what it feels like. It's super important. Can I go to the next one, please? Next one. So anatomy right now, we have Midtown Miami, Sunset Harbor, Miami Beach, Coconut Grove, one, uh, one hotel, South Beach. We're building Doral, and we have three going into uh, one hotels across the country that are actually large gyms. You go to the next one, please. They made a documentary about my life to help high school at-risk youth, and it's to show kids that anyone can do it if you stay on course. It's called Just the Kid from Fall River. You can watch it on any of those platforms. If you like sports and you like inspirational stories, you'll love this. My friend did it and drove to 50 interviews across the country to get people from NFL coaches, people from my hometown to tell this story to help kids. Next slide, please. This is the book you can get on Audible and Amazon. It just tells my story in I hope you give it a shot, but I have one question here, uh, a series of questions that I want to get this out. This is super important, so just participate in this thing because this is something that you, you're going to remember for a while. All right. If you walked into a gym because you desperately wanted to make a change in your mind or body, stand up. Stand up. If you went to a gym because you wanted to be a stronger human being, stand up. If you had a coach or a trainer that truly cared about you, stand up. If your gym community became your family, stand up. Lastly, if you wanted to impact the lives of others and give that special feeling that gym experiences gave you, stay up, turn to the person on your right and left, and tell them that they're making a difference right now. Tell them that they're making a difference. So listen. I know you're making a difference because I've talked with a lot of you and I'm super impressed by everyone and I'm taking notes because I'm learning everything from you. Thanks for sitting through this. I know it was torturous, but listen, you are making a difference and this is the group that's going to impact the lives of thousands and thousands of people. I'm going to follow all of you and you inspire the shit out of me. So stay on course and impact this world. Thank you. Hello.